Okay, so my name is Alex Jacob and I work with the Church's Ministry Among Jewish People and I've been working in that role for 15 years. Before that I had a proper job as a church minister uh, based firstly in Linton and uh, then before that uh, in Ellsbury and in and uh, in a place called Litchfield in, in the West Midlands. So let's move to the next slide and uh, um, so we just move forward to the next one. There we are. Thank you, Rufus. So we, I just want to get started on digging some foundations. Now, for some of you, this will be very familiar and it'll be a bit of a reminder. And that's absolutely fine. For others, this will be new. Don't worry, there's not going to be an examination at the end. But I just want to give a, a few bits of uh, foundations to begin with. So we're looking at the letter to the Romans. And we know that is written by Paul. Um, some scholars, some Bible teachers question uh, Paul's authorship for some of his letters. There's 13 letters in the New Testament which are ascribed to Paul, and some people question some of those. Um, but nobody has ever questioned the authorship of Romans by Paul. Um, so, you know, it's uncontested by anybody that Paul is the author of this letter. But if you look in Romans 16, verse 22, he also had a secretary, somebody to help him write that, um, a guy called Tertius, and so he also sends his greeting. So Paul is the author, but in one sense he was supported in that authorship by his secretary, Tertius. Now he's writing probably from Corinth around about the year 57. So this is probably during Paul's third missionary journey. Again, you know, you read different commentaries and they may be one or two little tweaks around that date but I think most people accept from Corinth around 57. Now that would place this letter right in the middle of Paul's teaching ministry. Most people would feel that Paul's ministry began around about um, the mid 40s um, and we had the reading um, from Acts which uh, Mandy read for us at the beginning which talked about Paul giving his testimony so he had this incredible encounter with the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, he then had a period to process all those changes in his life. Uh, and then he began a number of years later with a public ministry. And the first letter which he wrote in the New Testament is probably the letter to the Galatians. Uh, some people might argue Thessalonians, Thessalonians, but this would be around about 48 AD. And then the last letter Paul read, wrote, I believe, is the second letter to Timothy around about 68. So you've got about a 20 year window when Paul is traveling, teaching, writing on, 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 on a very large scale. I mean, he's you know, many missionary journeys, many letters. We have the 13 which are recorded in the New Testament, but it's almost certain he, he wrote and shared much more widely than the simple account we're given in the book of Acts. So the book of Acts just gives us, I suggest, the tip of the iceberg of his ministry, um, but it's a useful structure. So this is right in the middle of his ministry when he writes this major letter. The third thing I think just to say when we're establishing the foundations is that we often think of Paul as an apostle, someone who is sent to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, out to the nations. And that is certainly true. Paul, Paul is rightly described as an apostle or the apostle to the Gentiles. But he's also more than that. He's also a prophet within Israel. And I think this dual role is really important. If we're going to understand Paul correctly, we need to hold those two things together. Yes, of course, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, but he remains a prophet within Israel. He speaks to his own people. He gives a critique of Israel, a critique of Torah from an insider's perspective. And I think sometimes when people preach on Paul, they're giving you the impression that somehow, you know, he left behind his relationship with Israel. He, he, he's completely committed to the Gentile world and his Jewish heritage means very little at all. I, I think that's a misreading of Paul. I want to say Paul has a, a dual role and throughout his life, throughout his ministry, he remains as a prophet speaking into Israel. And he also is an apostle going out to the Gentile world. And I think that double role is really important. 
The other thing to say about this letter, it's a very specific letter, which helps prepare the ground for Paul's intended visit to Rome. We know from um, uh, Romans 15, verse 28, that Paul is planning to use Rome as a kind of stepping stone in order to go to Spain. Um, Paul, because he is sharing the gospel to the ends of the world, he wants to go to, the, to Spain because Spain is probably the, the edge of the known Roman Empire at that time. So he is saying quite clearly, I, I want to share a blessing with the church in Rome. I want to learn from you. I want, I want to minister to you. But I'm also looking for your support to help me to go from Rome all the way to Spain. Um, we don't know from the New Testament if Paul made that journey to Spain. We're, we're not sure. But certainly we know that was his intention. So it's a letter which is kind of personal to uh, the church in Rome, and it's personal about his plans to visit Rome uh, and then to go on to Spain. But it's more than that, because Romans, the church in Rome, was not established by Paul, he was not the founding apostle, many people in Rome didn't really know much about him. So Paul also shares about himself, but most importantly, he shares about the gospel message which he is uh, seeking to make known. So he gives an outline of the gospel, which is very structured, very systematic, and very detailed. If someone says to you, well, what is the gospel? One of the places you would do well to start is say, okay, let's look at the letter to the Romans, because there we have the most complete outline of the gospel, of anywhere in the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus, God's son. So it's a very, very wonderful letter because it has this detailed information. It has this objective account of the gospel, which is not found in many other places. Now, just one final thing about this plan to visit Spain. Um, some scholars make a connection between Jonah and Paul. Jonah is a prophet in the Old Testament. He has a book called the Book of Jonah. And it's interesting that Jonah is sent on a, a mission journey and he goes in the opposite direction. He actually wants to flee from his calling uh, and he goes in the opposite direction. He heads for a place called Tarshish, which was in southern Spain. And so Jonah is heading for Spain out of disobedience. And now some 800 years later, Paul is going to Spain for the right reasons to share the gospel. So I think there's an interesting kind of parallel or contrast between, between uh, Jonah and, uh, and, and Paul. So anyway, we don't know if Paul got to Spain, but we know that was his intention. So let's just move on to, to the next slide. We just have the next slide, Rufus, thank you. So, this is what Martin Luther said about Romans. Now, um, Martin Luther um, is a kind of mixed character in terms of Christian Jewish relations. Um, and for, we won't have time to go into all of that, but his commentary on Romans is, is seen to be one of the great classic commentaries of, of the, the, the church. And you could argue it was his engagement with the book of Romans, which was the catalyst for the Reformation. Um, so, you know, he, he, he came to a new understanding of the gospel. He came to understand what it meant to be saved by, by grace through faith, by, by faith through grace. He understood that, what it meant to be justified. And he had that inner experience of God's forgiveness, which he interpreted through the letter to the Romans. And this is what he says about, about this letter. It is a true masterpiece of the New Testament and the very purest gospel, which is well worthy and deserving that a Christian should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that one should daily deal with it as the daily bread of our souls. For it can never be too much read or studied, and the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. That's a wonderful uh, uh, kind of affirmation of this letter from, from Martin Luther uh, and he challenging us to learn it word by word. 
Now, that may be a bit ambitious for us tonight. We're not going to try and memorize it word by word. But what he's saying is, look, if you've got time to do some Bible study, where would you want to start? He's saying, please consider starting in, 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 in Romans. Um, just to give a little plug, um, I, I produced a new CMJ book last year, which is called 60 Days with Romans. And that may, if, if you're new to Romans and you want to get into this, this might be a good way in. Um, so uh, that's, that's available from the CMJ bookshop. So Martin Luther, incredible, important character in the reformation of the church. And that's his kind of um, advocacy for the book of Romans. OK, let's just move on to uh, the next slide. Thank you, Rufus. OK, you may know that the Church of England produced a major report on how the church relates to Jewish people, how Jewish Christian relations are developing. It was called God's Unfailing Word, and it was a really important report. And um, in that report, they focused on Romans 9 to 11. And, and they said this, Romans 9 to 11 provides the most sustained direct treatment in the New Testament of the question of what the lack of recognition of God's work in Christ on the part of most Jewish people means for the theological understanding of the Jewish people collectively as Israel. So what I think they're saying in, in that big study they did in 2019 was whatever you understand or whatever you don't understand about how the church relates to Israel, how Jewish believers relates to Gentile believers, whatever you make of this kind of stuff, really where you got to start is Romans 9 to 11. You know, we may have disagreements about how we interpret it, but unless you've done the work on Romans 9 to 11, you can't really engage in that kind of discussion. So um, there's some really good things in that report, but there's certain things which I think I would want to challenge. And that challenge and that engagement comes partly from an engagement with the Book of Romans, particularly Romans 9, 10 and 11. If you've been coming to Hepzibah for many years, I'm sure you've had lots of teaching on those chapters because it is kind of foundational to so much of what we're trying to share and explore and find out more about. So this just gives some background to why Romans is important. Now, if we move on to the next slide. Um, so when you're reading any book, and I think it's particularly true when you're reading a Bible book, it's like putting on a pair of specs and depending on the kind of way your lenses are set up, you kind of read the text uh, according to the lens you have. So a lot of people read Romans through what is called a supersessionist lens or, 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 or a lens of replacement theology. And what they kind of do is they see that Paul has been converted away from Judaism. He is now really, you know, working in the Gentile world. And all the promises to Israel are no longer valid. And this is about a gospel message which is detached from the biblical Jewish narrative. So if you're reading in that way, you, it really leads to an unqualified denial, an associated blindness, and a failure to see any of the Jewish contours in the book of Romans. And, you know, you often get that when people are preaching from Romans, you really feel they're looking at it in a certain way which takes Paul out of the biblical Jewish context. And I think you know, th there still may be some good things you discover through that, but you won't get the correct picture of, of the letter. The second lens which some people use, and I've already mentioned Martin Luther, a lot of Christians interpret the book of Romans through a Reformation lens. Again, that tends to distance interpretation and application away from a Jewish context. So for example, in the Reformation, you might talk about the legalism of, of the, the Roman Catholic Church and, and the freedom of, of, of reform, of reformed churches. You might talk about works versus faith in medieval Catholic tradition. You may talk about grace versus sacramentalism. You might talk about the tradition of the established medieval church and the purity of the gospel. All of that, it, 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 I'm sure, is valid. 
But really, the Book of Romans is not speaking into the Reformation. The Reformation used the truth of Romans in that process. But to, to read Romans from that Reformation perspective is not reading Romans in the correct original context. So I, I'm conscious when I hear people preaching from Romans that I think they're often using a supersessionate lens or a Reformation lens. For me, I want to use a Messianic Jewish or a Jewish mission lens and appreciate the Jewish contours of this letter. Um, and I think that's the best way to read Romans. Um, so we're going to be doing that now. So I just want to um, you know, say this is the kind of lens I'm trying to put on. And sometimes you know, we make mistakes. We don't always get this right. But I think that's the way in which you should engage with Romans. Um, with that lens of, of Messianic Jewish believers and with that Jewish mission lens uh, in, in, in focus. Okay, let's just move on to the next slide. Um, thank you. Um, so, as I said earlier, you know, Romans is often associated with the book of the Reformation. That's why I think so many people read it in that Reformation lens. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, thank you. Yeah, so just to say that this this is a quote actually here from um, a guy called Eugene Peterson, who actually wrote the Message Bible. You may, you may have heard of him. Um, and he's saying that at different times in the history of the church, God raises certain books of the Bible into prominence. I mean, that's an interesting idea. Um, so, for example, he's, he argues in this book um, that in the time of Augustine, the key book was the book of Genesis that provide, provided uh, the foundation to engage with a decadent and wrecked Roman Empire. Later on, he talks about songs of songs speaking into the, to the eroticism of, um, of the 12th century. And then he says Romans spoke into the Reformation. And that's why so often we, we deal with the book of, of Romans in that Reformation lens. And he says, you know, that's that's good, but we shouldn't be doing that now. Out of interest, um, you might just want to ask yourself this question. What book does Eugene Peterson say is the book for the church today in the 21st century? It's not Genesis. It's not Song of Songs. It's not uh, it's not Romans. It's actually the book of Revelation. He's saying that is the book for the 21st century church. Now, obviously, the whole of the Bible speaks to us, and you know we we, we don't you know have favourites in that sense. We want the whole of Scripture to, to 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 inform us, but he's convinced that you know it, the book which is going to define the 21st century church is our engagement with the Book of Revelation, just as the 16th century church was transformed by Romans, and he would argue the 12th century church by the Song of Songs, and the early church under Augustine engaging with the promises of Genesis. Anyway, that's just an interesting little, little sidetrack. But um, Eugene Peterson wrote a book called Under the Unpredictable Plant. It's a book about uh, ministry, um, preparing for Christian ministry. And I think it's the best book on this issue about how do you find a vocation of holiness. And this is just a bit of a side issue, but I wanted to share that with you. But the book is Eugene Peterson Under the unpredictable plant. Okay, let's just move on to the next slide. Now we're going to turn actually to the text of Romans. That was the previous part has just been a little bit of background for us tonight. So we talk about the book of Romans as recognizing the biblical Jewish perspective, trying to look through this lens in which we honor the messianic uh, reality of, 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 of the early church and this letter. So why is it a biblical Jewish book? What, why do we see a biblical Jewish perspective? Well, firstly, it's written by a Jewish man, Paul, about a Jewish man, the gospel of Jesus, who proclaimed the message of the kingdom and the method of response is personal discipleship. So if somebody said to you, okay, I got this gospel idea, I got this gospel, someone's talking to me about the gospel, you know, what is the gospel about? Well, it's about Jesus, of course, and it's about the kingdom. So the message of Jesus is always the message of the kingdom of God. 
And the question is then, how can I, how can you and I respond to the preaching of the kingdom? We respond by being invited to become disciples of Jesus. So the method of response is always personal discipleship. And we're responding to the kingdom through the gospel of Jesus. So you and I are born again, if we, if we become followers of Jesus, into the life of the kingdom, which Jesus brings us into. So the book of Romans is, is in that context. It's about the gospel and the kingdom and about discipleship. And that is, all those things can only be fully understood in a second temple biblical tradition in that, in that period. You know, the kingdom, discipleship, all these ideas are rooted in the Jewish scriptures. Um, and, and that provides a, a context for it. It's written to an emerging community of Jews and Gentiles. And that's, so again, we, we, it's written into that, into that diverse community of Jews and Gentiles. And in the book of Romans, there's a number of key questions, which are all from a Jewish perspective, namely, how can I draw close to and see the Holy One of God? How can I experience and know a righteousness rooted in faith as proclaimed by the prophet Habakkuk? Now, the teaching of, you know, the righteous shall be, live by faith belongs not to Luther, but of course, generations before. It, it goes right back to, to the time of Habakkuk. Um, so it's, it's, it's written um, uh, about... Uh, the, the, the promise of faith through the prophet Habakkuk as lived out by the patriarch Abraham. And the question really is, how can Gentiles share in the covenantal gifts of Israel? These are questions which are addressed and based upon the Jewish scriptures. So, I mean, just that general overview of Romans reminds us that this is a book which has a clear biblical Jewish perspective. Um, about 19%, uh, sorry, about 39% uh, um, of Romans 9 to 11, for example, are quotations from the Jewish scriptures. So, you know, to say that this is a Gentile presentation is, is, is simply not right. It is rooted in, in, in the Jewish context. Okay, let's just turn then to the next slide. Just move on to the next one if we can. Brilliant. So I'm just going to look at certain segments in, in Romans. Um, we haven't got time to go through to all of it, but I just want to look at some of the, the, key, the key passages. So, for example, um, let's focus on Romans 1, 1 to 17. So in the first seven verses here, as you open the book of Romans and you're trying to see it in this Jewish lens, we know that the gospel is rooted in the promises of, and, and, and the people and the prophecies of God as told in the Holy Scriptures. So, for example, you know, uh, Jesus is presented in terms of his uh, humanity as a descendant of David. Paul makes the same point in his final letter in the second Timothy chapter two. Um, now, this gospel stuff is transformative new news, yet it is woven into the eternal plan of God. Paul always emphasizes the continuity of the gospel while also declaring and exploring a profound discontinuity, which brings into focus new realities, new hopes, and new relationships. So, so for Paul, this gospel stuff, this stuff of the kingdom, this stuff about discipleship is connected with, 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 with all which has gone before. It, it's an ongoing unfolding story, yet it's also wonderfully new. And I think that's the kind of balance we have to hold together. So Paul holds together this, this continuity and this discontinuity. He also holds together the universal nature and the Pacific nature of God's salvation. Romans 1.16 makes that very clear, that the gospel is for everyone, everyone who believes. If you're listening to this meeting today, I'd always been, you pick it up on, on YouTube later on or whatever. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever your identity is, the gospel reaches out to you. It, it, it is you know, incredibly inclusive, universal, but it's also incredibly pacific. It is first to the Jew, um, or, or especially for the Jew. Um, 
And that's a focus of the uncompromising particularity of the gospel. Um, and Paul then goes on to talk about how the first for the Jew is related to Gentile faith and how Jews and Gentiles are grafted in. And we see that teaching in, in, in Romans 11 later on. But, but Paul here in the opening chapter introduces the gospel and, 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 and makes it clear that this is a continuation of the Jewish story. And this is why we see faith and righteousness linked to the prophet Habakkuk. This is gonna be developed further by going back, for example, in Romans four to the story of Abraham. So, you know, th this, is, this is going back, looking back to what is the foundation, Habakkuk, Abraham, the covenants, the promises, all of that is, 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 is a perfect presentation in a Jewish context. Um, so that's that's Romans ch chapter one, uh, one to seventeen. Um, and if we move on to um, Romans uh, to Romans two, the next slide. Again, we see in Romans two up into chapter three, verse four, Paul is spending a lot of time looking at the relationship between Jewish identity and faithfulness to the Torah, and he talks about issues around Jewish identity and election in chapter three. Um, for Paul, it is foundational de to declare that Jews and Gentiles are equal with regard to all aspects of salvation. Yet there are important distinctions and privileges. We are one, but we are not the same. So just as there is universality, the gospel is for everyone, but it's also a priority first for the Jew. There is a wonderful unity, uh, but we are, we, we are different. There, there is still a diversity. It's not one big melting pot where we all sort of merge together, there is a, a unity which allows for our own distinctiveness. There's no second class citizens. We're all equal in this, regardless if we're Jew or Gentile, male or female, whatever our racial background is, there's a wonderful unity, but there still remains a diversity. There's a freedom of diversity within the unity. Now, I think for me, uh, when, I, when I was a church leader for 21 years before I started working for CMJ, the most difficult thing I think any church leader has to do um, is how can you maintain the unity of the church while allowing for appropriate individual freedom? So, you know, somebody in the church might say, for example, I'm con convinced that every Christian should be a vegetarian. It might be a, an ethical position someone takes. No, I think you've got to say, fine, you're, you're allowed to, to you know, share that, but you can't force that onto other people. Now, it seems to me if someone wants to campaign to be a vegetarian as a Christian, I think that's a very good thing for them to do. Some of us might be convinced, others won't be. But if you said, for example, unless you are a vegetarian, you cannot join this church, that's where individual conscience and conviction has gone too far, and the diversity has destroyed the unity. So. Any church leader has to maintain discipline within the church and he or she has to decide where there is appropriate diversity and where that diversity crosses into some kind of heresy. Um, and uh, this is so important. And I think Romans, which is trying to maintain the unity of Jew and Gentile while allowing for diversity, both between Jews and Gentiles and between different individuals, um, how, we, how Romans sums this up and what Romans teaches is of immense value. If we want to get relationships right in the church today, we have to get that core relationship of unity and diversity, um, freedom and also restrictions on that freedom to maintain a community life. So Romans chapter two, I think is foundational for that. Uh, Romans chapter three, nine to 20, Paul teaches here on universal human sinfulness, and he quotes from the Psalms, the prophets, and the Proverbs. So again, we see the Jewish contours. We already had Habakkuk being quoted from. We had, a, we're gonna have a reference in chapter four to Abraham, but now in chapter three, it's Psalms, prophets, and, and Proverbs. And uh, we, that's, that's really important in, 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 in chapter three. And then if we move on to the next slide, please, Rufus, we're coming just to the, to the next part in Romans 3, which in some people's minds is really the centre of the letter, where Paul talks about the sacrifice of atonement. And Paul is, is, is teaching about how Jesus' death on the cross makes sinners, 
right with God. And again, this teaching about atonement, this teaching about the power of the cross, can only really be understood when it's rooted in the sacrificial tradition of the temple, of going back to, for example, Leviticus 16. So what Paul is clear to show is that Jesus's atoning death both covers and washes clean away sin. So if you are in a right relationship with God through Jesus, what Jesus' death does for, for you is two things. And both of these things are, are wonderfully uh, to understand. There's a sense in which you are washed clean. I mean, it connects partly with the symbolism of baptism. So the power of the blood of Jesus, his death cleans people, it, you know, dirty, broken people like you and me are made clean by the power of the cross. We can be forgiven. And that's wonderful. And that's beautiful. And because we're washed clean, a process of transformation begins. This is something which God does in and through us. But also, what Paul is clear to teach from Leviticus 16, is that also there are certain sins where God covers us. It's not so much that we are being made cleansed by, by his death, but his, his death covers us. So rather than God looking upon us as sinners, he looks upon us through the righteousness of Christ. So there's a sense in which I think both of these things are important, that we can go through a process of being washed clean and the process would lead to sanctification. But equally, we never get beyond the point where we just simply need to stand in the covering of the atonement of Christ. So we can pursue holiness, but we're not made holy. And that's why there's a covering as well as a washing. And both those things are, are really important. So Paul is both foretelling and foreshadowing the sacrificial system set out within the Torah and the associated temple practices. So this is why, unless we see Romans in that Jewish context, we will not understand how the atonement works. Now, in one sense, it's always a mystery. It's beyond any of us can understand. But by engaging with Leviticus 16, we see both the cleansing and the covering, which is foundational, I think, to a healthy sense of what it means to be forgiven um so that's 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 really important again looking in romans chapter five we see that paul is using an interpretive method made popular by one of the rabbis uh, it's 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 a well-established method in which he takes an example and he says from this first point how much more will god do something else so it's it's, it's a well-known rabbinic teaching method and we can see that throughout Romans 5 and in Romans 11 as well. But of course, it's also used in the ministry of Jesus. So, you know, when Jesus talks about, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, he talks about you know, as a loving parent, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. You, know, you made them pancakes this evening. You've been a great parent. But how much more will you know, God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. You know, you can you, you, you start from the smaller principle and then you apply it to a bigger principle about God's character. So again, the interpretive method, the teaching method of Romans 5 makes sense if you read it through the lens of the rabbinic tradition and, of course, the tradition of Jesus himself. So that's that's really, really important as well. Um, so let's just move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. In, in Romans chapter five, again, moving on. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, could you just go back one, sorry. Um, just go back one, that's it, perfect. Um, Paul uses here the analogy of Adam and Jesus. So again, he goes right back now. He started with Habakkuk, back to Abraham in chapter four. Now he's back of, with Adam. And his analogy based on contrast. Now, I think when Paul talks about, you know, uh, the new Adam or the second Adam, um, he's not actually teaching original sin. Um, and, and I think this is where, again, sometimes if, if we're not seeing it in a, in a biblical Jewish context, we're, we're, we're putting on a reformation principle, um, which, which is there. Um, uh, and I think here, you know, I, I think some people make more of this passage in Christian theology than is actually there in, in, in Paul's writing in Romans 5. 
Uh, this is quite a complex issue and, and we won't have time to go through it tonight. But if you are interested in what does Paul mean about the sin of Adam, um, I think a really good place to look at that is David Stern's New Testament com commentary. He actually devotes nearly um, um, you know, 20 pages or so to that argument. It, he doesn't do that almost anywhere else, but because this is an important issue. So if you want to get into that a bit more, uh, do look at David Stern's New Testament commentary. Um, that's, that's really good. The other thing which I think if you read for a supersessionist lens, you'll never see this. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to 14, Paul upholds the Torah as holy, righteous, and good. And uh, again, often that is something which is missed if we don't read through that, that lens. But it's very clearly there in, in, in Scripture. Romans 7, 7 to 14, the Torah is holy, righteous, and good. So pursuing the Torah is not, is not a faultless, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a pointless exercise. It has real purpose. And, uh, and um, that, that's something which Paul, Paul has a very positive view of the law, the Torah. And sometimes we don't, we don't see that. So moving on to the next slide. Excellent. So, and again, just a, a few snippets. I mean, you know, Romans 8, verse 32 to 39, that, you know, Paul declares that God did not send his, did not spare his own son. Again, that makes very little sense unless you link it back to Genesis 22 with the sacrifice, uh, uh, Abraham's uh, attempt to sacrifice the child of promise, Isaac. Um, so, and also in here, Paul is dealing with the sufferings of, of, of many in the church, and he quotes from Psalm 44. Um, and, and again, it's interesting that in, in the time of, of, of the Maccabees, it was the same Psalm which the rabbis were quoting to talk about martyrdom, those who were, who were martyred by their resistance to, to, to the pagan forces. And Paul is using the same line of thinking, the same text to talk about Christian suffering. Uh, in, in, for, in, as you know, some of us are called to suffer for our faith in Jesus. And that is part of the martyrdom tradition going back to the rabbis and to, to Judas the Maccabee. So again, if, we, if, if we're not looking at that context through that lens, we will miss that. I think when we're looking at Romans chapter eight and then looking at Romans nine to 11, which was said to be one of the key passages in this whole area. And here again, we see the continuing election of the Jewish people. We also see the promise that all Israel will be saved. And we also see the, the, the complete need to share the gospel with all Jewish people. We also see the, in, the importance of the Jewish remnant and the interdependency and mutual blessing shared between Gentile believers Jewish believers and the wider Jewish community, particularly through the, 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 the image of the olive tree and branches being cut off and, and grafted back in. So this clearly is, is something which has to be understood within the Jewish contours of, 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 of the Bible. And of course, the image of the olive tree is, is, is an image which is used, the metaphor is used throughout, throughout the Old Testament. So again, we see in all these references so much which shows us the Jewish contours of the, of the letter to the Romans. Okay, we've just got a couple more slides before we come into land. So um, um, just move on to the next slide. So what happens in Romans 12 to 15 is that there's a shift in the letter to the Romans. If, you, if you're new to Romans, you, you may not always pick this up, but the first 11 chapters is really a focus on what do we believe about the gospel. In other sense, it's about doctrine. It's about, you know, it's, it's, it's about the content of the faith. So we, it, Paul talks about the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. He talks about the importance of the law. He talks about the power of sin, the life of the spirit. This is doctrinal teaching. But the final chapters, 12 to 15, says, okay, I understand now what the gospel is about. I understand the content of the gospel, but how then should I live my life? Chapters 12 to 15 is a, it's a new dimension in the letter. It's the application of the faith. It's the outworking of the faith. And often I think this is very Jewish. I think often in kind of Christian teaching, we often focus very much on the orthodoxy, you know, what we believe. The, the, the word. Well, often in Jewish tradition, it's much more about the praxis, the practice, what we actually do. 
Now, we believe both are really important because I think our actions will be shaped by our belief and our actions will shape our beliefs. But Paul is here is very keen and he goes here into the orthopraxy of faith. And I think this follows a very strong, well-established Jewish teaching tradition, you know, beginning with the text, beginning with the revelation of the law, beginning with the truths of what we believe, and then applying that into, into our situation today. Um, and I, I think that's so, so important. So in this practical outworking of faith, this includes, as I said at the beginning, Paul's plan to visit Spain. He, he's also collecting an offering to support those in Jerusalem during the famine. That this act of charity has very important uh, implications for the partnership between, between uh, Jews and, and, and Gentiles. So we see that outworking of that in Romans 12 to 15. And then in the final part of the letter, chapter 16, um, again, we see the Jewish contours that we have many references to Jewish believers. The first one is in chapter 16, verse 7, but we have the same in verse 11 and again in verse 21. So we know that the community in Rome was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. And Paul is sharing the gospel as a Jewish man encountering a Jewish message, a message which is to the Jew first, but equally to the whole world. And it's that balance, it's, it's, it's that beautiful harmony which makes the letter come alive to you. And I think if you, reading it through a supersessionist lens or simply through the history of the Reformation, you may well be blessed, but the bigger blessings is if you can actually begin to see uh, this, this Jewish contour with, within, within Romans. Okay, let's just move on to the final slide. And uh, uh, thank you for listening so well tonight. I know it's sometimes, I find sometimes listening and teaching on Zoom is, is not quite as easy as doing it live. Um, but why, why, why is this important? Well, I think what we're trying to do is to build bridges particularly in reaching out to our Jewish friends, in some cases, our Jewish family, in our Jewish communities with the gospel. We're trying to build bridges and we're trying to remove obstacles. And seeing and celebrating and teaching the Jewish contours of the gospel, particularly here in the book of Romans, but also, of course, you know, in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, helps to build bridges and it removes obstacles in Jewish evangelism. It also helps the ongoing reformation and renewal of the church. So the good news we share, the gospel, is the outworking of the, of the abiding covenant. So when we're sharing the gospel with a Jewish person, we are saying, this is part of your story. This is not an alien import. Uh, despite, you know, sadly, the church's long history of anti-Semitic attitudes and a largely Gentile agenda, the core message, the foundation, is the completion of the Jewish story. It, 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 it is, you know, you have a home ground advantage here because this is this is your story this is the abiding covenant this is the outworking of the promises made to Habakkuk and Abraham and 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 and, and the, the story of Jonah all of this connects to to the gospel story and what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is the pinnacle of God's revelation but to understand Jesus as the pinnacle, you have to have the foundation and all that which has gone before, or the pinnacle becomes meaningless. Jesus is the pinnacle of God's revelation, and that's, of course, central to Paul's teaching. And it's there, of course, in John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians 2, uh, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, and many other places as well. So this is important for our own personal discipleship, but I think it's also important in trying to make sure when we're sharing the gospel in the Jewish context, we're showing that there are bridges which we can build into that community. There's obstacles which can be removed because we are not trying to implant an alien, an other message. But this is part of the fulfilling and, and, and the enlarging of the Jewish promise. And the second thing which I think is important is that um, we are never called to denigrate Jewish life in order to make Christianity appear better. Some people are very keen to sort of say, oh, well, you know, Jewish people, they're kind of legalistic, they're rooted in the law, 
you know, the gospel, you know, and, and in order to present the gospel, you are denigrating somebody else. That is antithetical to the gospel. You don't need to put anybody down or, or, or to ridicule anybody. Uh, Jesus needs no foil against which he is to be made more appalling, more, more appealing, because we have the unique beauty of Jesus. Um, so, it, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, when I'm showing the gospel in the Jewish country, I'm not trying to criticize rabbinic teaching, I'm not trying to criticize the synagogue or, or, or the foolishness of Jewish people who have said no to him throughout history. I, I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I don't need to denigrate anybody to present the beauty and the truth of the gospel. And I think, again, so dealing with Romans in the Jewish context helps you not to denigrate Jewish life, and it helps you to build bridges and to remove obstacles. To perpetuate a supersessionate reading of the Bible is actually to compromise the gospel message. And I think it makes evangelism almost impossible. It becomes an expression of power, not an expression of God's redeeming love. And uh, so... For us uh, in CMJ, we have the privilege over 200 years of trying to share the gospel of Jewish people. But when we understand we're sharing a Jewish message about a Jewish saviour, a uh, Jewish messiah, it means there's a freedom and, and a confidence in doing that, which I don't think you can ever have unless you're beginning to explore those issues. So um, thank you for listening so well. It, it's been a bit of a whirlwind tour through 16 chapters of Romans and trying to give some foundational stuff. There's a lot more which I think can be shared, but I, I judge tonight if this has been helpful, this has been good, um, by hopefully one or two people here are inspired to reread Romans. I mean, if you do that, then uh, I will have my pancakes later tonight and I'll be a happy man. Um, so just a couple of books to reference at the end i mentioned the 60 days of romans which is available from the cmj website um, my own book on enlargement theology is also available and that deals with romans 9 to 11 in a lot more detail um, there's an excellent commentary on romans by by a jewish believer called joseph schumann s-h-u-l-a-m and that's a commentary on the jewish roots of romans uh, i think this is really really good I mentioned David Stern's commentary, which I think still remains the go-to starting point for any of this kind of work. And um, just finally, um, uh, I've just produced a new CMJ book, which came out this week. And uh, this is called Thinking Aloud. This is available from um, the website, brand new. It was really launched for something called Lent, which some of you, I know, read, enjoy. And so this is 30 readings uh, to take you through Lent or it may also work equally well during an extended lockdown. So, so maybe, maybe it has uh, two purposes. But anyway, but anyway, thanks for listening so well, and, but I hope you will engage back with the text of Romans. And if you've got some questions or points, uh, I'll do my very best uh, to engage with those now. But, but thanks for listening. Cheers. Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, a very interesting talk. We've now got an opportunity if anybody has a question to ask, will they uh, please uh, unmute themselves, ask the question and then remute themselves. So, and please don't speak across other people. So uh, I'm busy looking at the screen at the moment to see if there are any hands up of people who would like to ask a question. I don't see any at the moment. Ah, oh, there is one. Amanda, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Rufus. It's very basic, um, Alex. I just didn't quite catch what you were saying about Romans 5. You said that um, it seemed, what I got down was that it seems to be following rabbinic teaching method, which is also used by Jesus. Is there a name of that rabbinic teaching method? Yes, it, it's, it, it, in English, it talks about how much more the method is. It, it, oh, it's called how much how more. How much more, Thank yeah. Or, or, yeah, or, I mean, in, in Hebrew, it's, it's it Kalvog Kamor. So K-A-L-V, K-H-O, 
MER. You might you might have that technical term in some commentaries. Oh, it's, it's basically starting with you know as I say you know if a parent can love a child, how much more will God love his children? Yes, so and, and and we see that method used um, you know in, in the teaching ministry of Jesus, for example, Matthew twelve and Luke eleven. You've got those examples, but Paul uses the same method um, in in Romans. Um, so again, it's just picking up that, you, you know, if you're familiar with that, you see, oh, yes, this is part of that uh, context of, 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 of rabbinical teaching. Yes. Thank you so much. And just to summarize the, the book that you said written by a Jewish believer, was it yeah. Shulman? Yeah, Shulman? It's, it, it's, it's Joseph Shulman, S-H-U-L-A-M. Thank you. And uh, yeah. It's a really good commentary on Romans. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, so it's worth it's worth getting. Um, but you can also you can also get some CMJ books as well. <laughs> That's it. Be a good salesman, uh, Alex. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Any other questions? Simon, unmute yourself, please. Unmuted. Oh yeah. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Um, Alex, uh, one of the things I picked up, you mentioned uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and Jesus' uh, pr the pr propitiation, always hard to say, isn't it? Yeah. The propitiation. And you referred to Leviticus 16, and I was just wondering, were there any kind of like, were there maybe other readings or readings in the Hebrew scriptures that we could really kind of like read around that, you know, to sort of deepen our understanding? Yes, I, I, I certainly think I, I would suggest people start at Leviticus 16. I, I think that's that's really helpful. And I, what I'm trying to suggest within the sacrificial system coming out from that, you, you, you've got this idea, I think, of of both sacrifice, which removes sin, cleanses sin and covers from sin. So, so I think I think those two aspects are, are really important. And then I think you could also, as you go deeper into that, I, I think this idea of, of the tabernacle, you know, this idea that God comes and dwells with us. Uh, in the temple, you've got these different gradients of holiness. You know, you, you've got the outer courts and the inner courts, and you're, and you're coming into the Holy of Holies. And I think particularly, I would suggest, if someone's trying to get into this and trying to understand it, you know, to, to, to look at the story of the tabernacle, the deliverance from Egypt, um, Leviticus 16. Um, some of the Psalms are particularly strong on that uh, as well. And then read that in the light of Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, which I think really is a commentary back on the tabernacle and the temple. And uh, I can't, I'm not sure who, who wrote Hebrews. If you want to know the answer, you need to invite me back to Hepzibah and I'll, I'll tell you next time. But uh, I, if I if I'm going to have a guess, it would be Luke. I actually think Luke is the author of Hebrews, but I can't can't prove that. Of course, um, if I could, I could sell lots of books and retire. But I think Luke is the, is the author of Hebrews, and I think he's writing to priests who have become followers of Jesus, and they're they're, they're struggling with their identity because you know they, they are probably no longer serving in the temple, um, and and what have you. So I, I would Simon, I think I'll do the work on Leviticus. Look at um, some of the passages in Exodus, and I think focus on the tabernacle and the temple and, 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 and the traditions around that, and then read back from Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. I think that'd be really helpful. I think the other thing which are kind of clear in, in, in the big picture of the Bible is that God comes and, and dwells with us. Um, so we have the temple, so the tabernacle first, and then the temple, um, which, um, in a sense, is how God meets us. So the temple is central to Jewish biblical life. Um, but when the temple was destroyed in AD 68 to 70, during um, the Jewish revolt uh, by the Romans, the destruction of the physical temple, in one sense, was, was really destructive for the Sadducees, um, the Jewish community associated with the priesthood. I mean, it, I mean, nobody really survived from that point, that, that movement. The, the Pharisees, the, the more rabbinic tradition, was able to recalculate their theology 
there's no longer a temple, but guess what? There's still the scriptures, there's still the synagogue. So Pharisaical Judaism, what you might call rabbinical Judaism today, is, is a Judaism which is re-evolved post the temple. The destruction of the temple is bad news, but it's not the end of their story because they can recreate something. Um, and that's what Pharisaical Judaism is. It's, 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 it's a recreation of Judaism without the sacrifice, without the temple. Um, now, Messianic Judaism or Christianity, the destruction of the temple is not the end of the story. And in some ways, it's not even difficult. In one sense, it is kind of good news, if you can use that, because what Jesus is saying is that his body is a metaphor of the temple. Uh, and more importantly, and this is going back to the point of holiness, you and I become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So there is this journey from a physical temple to a spiritual temple within the lives of believers. And I think that's part of the bigger kind of atonement story. And Paul is very strong on that in Romans. And again, of course, in Corinthians, you know, he, he talks there uh, you know, about he who had no sin you know, be, became sin for, more, for my sake. And he talks about the covering and cleansing of Jesus. And he talks about uh, we become uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's the big picture. And I think we miss that unless we do the work with, 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 with the Old Testament temple and traditions. Sorry, Simon, that was a very long answer to a very, very good question of yours. Sorry. Right. One final question, then, before we go into a time of prayer. I see David's hand up. Will you unmute yourself, David, please? Well, it's not so much a question, but uh, to reinforce what uh, you said, Alex, about uh, the question of uh, sacrifice for our sin, the guilt issue, and the covering issue. It's reflected in the, in the Jewish year because uh, uh, the Passover is to deal with our personal sin. Uh, Christ died for us, the atoning work of Christ for us personally. But at the end of the year, they have, of course, a day of atonement and they have uh, where they're celebrating uh, the, the covering that is beyond just... Uh, my personal awareness of sin when I come to God and I, I, I ask for forgiveness. And so you're absolutely right. It's quintessential. And uh, unfortunately, because what you've been teaching us tonight is not so clear to people, we miss how beautifully everything is woven together and how uh, uh, the uh, Judaism is fulfilled in the gospel and the gospel is fulfilled in Judaism. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you, David. And I think, you know, this is one of the strengths of a group like this is that this is where we can explore. It's a safe place to ask questions. Some of the, you know, different stages on the journey. But I think when we see those connections, uh, as you rightly say, David, you know, it is, it is beautiful and it's also uh, you know, awe-inspiring, isn't it? Yes. And, we, and we feel incredibly humbled. And, you know, you know, the more we find out about all of this, the, the more we, we want to know. You know, we, we're, we're aware that we're, we're all, we're all we, we never get beyond being disciples. We, we, all, we, we all just continue learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so much more to discover. And I think connecting with the festivals and the liturgical Jewish year, I think that brings real insight to this as well. Uh, but maybe that's a talk for another day. But, uh, we'll have to be inviting you back, Alex. I can see that. I uh... yeah. Or, 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 or I think David would do that much better than I would. Well, there, there's an idea. We'll have to yeah. talk to David there. Right, yeah. Alex. What are your three subjects for prayer? Okay, just three things connecting to um, the ministry of the church's ministry among Jewish people. Um, this, this remains slightly confidential, so don't sort of, you know, uh, tell the whole world and its wife if you can't help it. But we are planning a major outreach 